Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome. Um, let me add my voice to those who have congratulated you and seeing you achieve this position because I know your life's work has been spent around solving complex humanitarian problems and trying to build out the systems for justice and self-sustainment. I think this is a perfect fit for you. As the chairman said, you're among friends. Everyone on this committee has chosen to be here because we do deeply understand that the, uh, the ideals of USAID and America's, the rest of America's very generous commitment to trying to solve humanitarian problems uh, from which we benefit both economically and culturally, but also creating international stability is essential for our national security. Uh, these are the motiv motivating factors for, for everyone here. So we're partners, we're friends, and that means, of course, we, we ought to be in constant dialogue about how we achieve mutually shared goals. In that regard, um, I appreciate the, in your opening remarks, you raised the issue of the Nineveh Plain in northern Iraq. The, the difficulties of Iraq are, are well known to us all, but in that particular area where you, you had a, a tapestry of religious plurality for centuries, where Christians and Yazidis and Muslims and certain other religious minorities lived side by side. Uh, when you lose that, you create a vacuum in a space uh, that is not only an impediment to justice to allow the peoples of these ancient traditions their rightful return to their rightful homeland, but also the conditions for ongoing pluralism. And so this is why this is absolutely critical. I want to show you something. Last year, when the House unanimously passed the genocide resolution that declared what was happening to Yazidis and Christians and others to be genocide, followed then by Secretary of Kerry, Kerry's announcement, uh, there was a gentleman in the balcony who was a Yazidi from Sinjar. And this is a picture of him. He returned to Sinjar while they, after the area was cleared, but it still was not safe. He was actually under fire and returned to his home. But next to his home was an ancient Christian church, and this is what he saw, a pile of rubble. And he fashioned a cross out of two wooden pieces of board that he found and put it on that ancient Christian church. And I asked him, I met him afterward, I asked him why he did this. He said, these were my brothers. Again, when you lose the conditions for plurality, mutual understanding, building bridges between different people, the prospects for long-term form of healthy nationalism and peace in that very conflicted part of the world go away. So I think it's of utmost urgency, given the genocide resolution and given your your agencies um, being on point in solving the most pressing humanitarian problems, that we move beyond, and I, I get, don't get me wrong, I appreciated the, the fact that you emphasized and, and have made this a priority, but when you say we're looking for innovative ideas from a broad coalition of partners, the problem is the window of time here is very, very narrow. There is an urgent crisis. You have millions of displaced people, Yazidis, Christians, others in Kurdistan, Lebanon, a few other places, who have a right to return, if there is resecuritization, the possibility of revitalization, then we can have the conditions for repatriation. I, I suggest that this is not a matter of a year, it's probably a matter of three to six months. Or then the pressures for migration increase, we lose the possibility again of reestablishing this ancient tapestry of religious pluralism, and again, a healthy, the possibility of healthy nationalism there. So, my point in bringing this, and I have a couple other things I think I'll have to get to in the next round, is to suggest that there is an urgency here, and if you could further refine what we're talking about as innovative ideas from a broad coalition of partners, I think it would help. Because we, we by sometimes necessity, sometimes bureaucratic constructs, are slow to react, and this demands an urgent reaction. Uh, Thank you, and as you know, I share your concern. Uh, the BAA process that we've announced is actually uh, swift, it, it, at least by uh, bureaucratic terms. It is a matter of months. It is one among the fastest mechanisms that we have, and part of it is we want to make sure that we are able to get input from the community themselves, and this process will allow us to do that. Um, it, one of those um, things that I learned as I came to the job not quite three months ago was the depth of devastation that's taking place in the Nineveh Plain. But you pointed to the right thing. This is not a matter of singling out a minority. It's pluralism. 
and it's a key component of the greatness of Iraq's past and hopefully the greatness of its future. A marginalized community is a key part, a, a core value of USAID and a key part of our work and needs to continue to be. And in this case, uh, you know, we're, we're focusing, as you've suggested, and doing our best to mobilize it. I do represent the largest Yazidi community in America, by the way. And if there is an opportunity for- Corn Huskers all? Uh, they, on their traditional flag, it's a yellow background with a big red, and I call it Husker red symbol. Okay on it, but uh, I'm quite certain they would be very eager, very rapidly to plug into this process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, in your opening comments, you mentioned as part of your mission is to do what we can to stop wildlife trafficking. Obviously, the loss of species is a concern, but also as it leads to terrorist financing networks and the disruption of, of, of basic important local economies and a sustained eco ecosystem. I want to bring something to your attention that we're working on in Botswana. There's the Okavanga, uh, which is a pristine wilderness area made possible by the highland waters that come down from Angola and Namibia. Uh, Botswana does an incredibly good job of managing this through private concessions uh, under government authority, but clearly need to be aggressively working with both the countries of Namibia and Angola for its long-term sustainability. As Angola moves out of its uh, difficult period, there's my understanding of the memorandum of understanding between our Defense Department and Angola. There's a new president coming in shortly. We've uh, spoken with them. There's a group of members working on a new concept. I've spoken as well with the Namibian representatives who are also interested in this idea of a transnational conservation area. So there is a piece of legislation that is, is uh, being worked now that hopefully will be introduced shortly. Uh, it would primarily potentially involved in the Interior Department and Wildlife and Fisheries, but there's going to be some nexus, I suspect, with you as well. This, again, is a significant idea to think beyond national boundaries as to how you create the conditions of a holistic ecosystem, which is beneficial to communities and persons, and then la allows for the uh, more proper migration of, of wildlife so that, again, they're sustained over time, leading to economic benefits versus just simply resource extraction, which may disrupt really an environmentally pristine area. There's also geopolitical benefits of this as well, and that we are bringing a creative, innovative, entrepreneurial vision of sustainability versus other countries that just want to pull stuff out. Bring that to your attention because this is coming your way shortly. The second issue quickly is um, I've spent some time studying an, an OPIC uh, endeavor, Overseas Private Investment Corporation, in which they do, are doing exactly what you pointed out you want to explore as to how you better leverage private sector and even uh, the private market dynamics to create sustainability mm -hmm. of charitable or humanitarian projects. Here, OPIC participates in a private equity fund. The, so does the Gates Foundation. So there are social, certain social metrics that are built into actually a private profit-making venture which returns the U.S. government money, but it's targeted to sustainable medical systems among the poor, uh, cross-subsidized by the wealthy because they go to the same clinics because these clinics work. So I'll, we can have a longer discussion about that, but it's one of the more innovative things I've seen out there that actually makes us money, does not require troops to stand there and guard the facility in order for it to be successful, and is leveraging the best of the private market, even though it seems peculiar that the United States is indirectly involved in a private equity fund. Uh, uh, very quickly, uh, I met with the Secretary of Interior uh, last week, and we just began our conversations about some of the international conservation programs, which I, I think, A, are a great part of our heritage, but B, um, a skill set that we can help export. We can help build the capacity of other countries towards ecotourism and, and sustainable ecotourism. Um, so uh, I'll take a look at the legislation, but um, I'm aware of some of the concepts and, and pre uh, really preserving those corridors are obviously key in a number of ways. Secondly, um, one of the things that I've also picked up since I've been on the job is I'm now a member of the board of OPIC uh, by virtue of being administrator. Uh, I've had one board meeting. We've begun those discussions. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that our development finance institutions, including USCID's Development Credit Authority, are closely aligned. We need to deploy all of those tools in so many situations to make the dollars go further, but more significantly, we better access private capital. 
eighty percent of the money that's flowing from America to the developing world is commerce. It's private commerce, it's it's remittances and you know, we need to be able to tap into those. If we don't, we're working with such a small piece of the pie, we're really not leveraging development outcomes. So it's, I think, a very exciting area.